Who's first? All right. Well, welcome everybody. Yeah. Um, it's good to see everybody here. Uh, we have a really interesting mix of people from here in Vermont and surrounding areas. Uh, video, as you saw briefly, from uh, some activists from Labrador. We have a special guest from Quebec who will be. Uh, saying a little bit after the video and also uh, helping answer some questions. Um, so we have uh, basically five presentations that will each go for about 10 minutes. Uh, I'll introduce people uh, in turn. I'm Brian Tokar. I'm a lecturer in environmental studies at UVM. I've written several books, including most recently Toward Climate Justice, and I'm on the board of 350 Vermont and the Institute for Social Ecology. And we've been working with lots of other good folks on pulling together the events that are happening both today and tomorrow in response to uh, the annual meeting of uh, New England governors and Eastern Canada premiers, which as you all know is happening up at the top of the mountain in Stowe. Um, if you don't know that we have campsites and are going to be camping and doing some strategizing and conversations uh, this evening and tomorrow, and then we'll be up uh, outside the resort where they're meeting uh, mid-afternoon tomorrow. And if people uh, aren't familiar with the details or have any questions about the particulars of what we're doing, uh, feel free to ask uh, or uh, we'll have an update at the end of the session. So I want to introduce my friend Jeffrey Gardner. Uh, he's a writer and a translator, grew up in the anti-war movement in New York City, was a tenants rights and environmental justice activist in Minneapolis. Cambridge, Mass, and here in New England, and for the past five years, he's been a member of the illustrious Upper Valley Affinity Group. Yeah, working on, illustrious. <laughs> working on energy, climate, and climate justice issues, looking for clues about how and where the climate movement should focus and take action. Jeffrey will talk to us briefly about the triangle of corporations, their investors, and the regulators who continue to propel us into climate chaos. Here, Jeffrey. I thought what I would do is talk about the history of how we got to where we are, especially with respect to electricity. Long ago, 140 years ago, Thomas Edison had the bright idea, having invented the incandescent light bulb, that he could bring electricity into homes. Then lighting by electricity wouldn't be restricted to arc lighting in the streets. That had already been done. He began to do that. What it required was very big, very heavy electrical lines that had to be buried. And what's more, the loss in moving electricity across those lines, 100 volts at a time, not very much, caused a huge amount of resistance and it was very inefficient. A lot of electricity was lost. Other people had a bright idea. If we put these lines overhead and made them very small, we can use these new things called transformers and we can step up the generation of electricity or we can step up the amount of voltage that we send across these lines from the source of generating and then we can step it down again with transformers on the other side. And thus began the battle of the currents, as it was called, or the war of the currents. And very, very quickly, for all kinds of good reasons, AC current won out over Edison's DC current. Why? You could move electricity over long, long distances without very much loss. You could do it cheaply because you didn't have to invest in huge wires and you didn't have to dig up the ground. You just put up posts and strung small wires. And it was popular. Why was it popular? One reason was you didn't have noisy plants generating electricity within a mile of where you lived or even closer than that. You could put your plants way, way far out and away from everyone. That was very attractive. You could have this wonderful source of energy without even realizing that it was there. And this touches on problems actually like mega dams and where we put our electric plants and our situation here in Vermont actually. Why? The places that were important initially 
in stringing AC wires and generating AC power were the industrial and urban centers. Rural places, oh, they could be where you put the plants. They didn't matter so much. And in fact, by 1935, just about every urban center in America was fully electrified. The rate of electrification in rural America, about 11 percent. These places didn't matter. They were just the places in between, as often they are in real estate. I was once talking to a real estate agent, and I described where I live, and she said, oh, you live in one of those places that holds the world together. And she didn't mean that in any sense, except that I'm interested in real estate value here and there, and there's nothing in between. That's just holding, it's the glue that holds the world together. She didn't mean anything ecological. Rural places were like that relative to utilities and electricity. It wasn't until about 1947, after World War II, that not even fully electrified, but rural areas were about 75, 78% electrified. And then finally they made it into the 20th century by JFK's time, 1960 or so. And we find that really hard to think about because we're so adapted to the way we live, the power we use, and we don't think much, although maybe we do, but we as a big collective don't think much about where it comes from. Now, an interesting thing about the way this battle worked out in the end is that if you were going to build these big plants further away, that required big capital, lots of investors to put up the money to build that infrastructure rather than this small company, that small company that would have been required by DC. And DC would have been close to its customers. Each smaller company would have had its customers. They would have been relatively close. You wouldn't have had this vast, vast centralization of the power source and the transmission lines and the grid that they eventually came to depend on. And this meant that in any area that was electrified, basically all the urban areas of America, you would have usually one big company that had captured the market. No market, no competition, <laughs> no regulation by market of the price. This goes contrary to laissez-faire. It's a situation more like what the railroads were or big shipping companies. But even there, there was some measure of competition, at least in certain areas. That there was no competition meant that people had to be protected from price gouging. Therefore, you got regulatory agents, agencies that set the rates according to rules that they developed. So you have big single corporations, you have monopoly regulation by government agencies, and all of this depends on AC power. What has that gotten us? It's gotten us a regulatory system where the big companies come in, they say, this is what we want to do. The regulators look at it. Mainly what they look at is to see whether there are enough investors or reasonable economic plan so that the whole thing will fly. One interesting thing is that in the last 20 to 30 years, the investors at the level of generating power are somewhat less important than they used to be. You see that with something like the gas power line. This is not electricity now, but heating right here in Vermont. There are investors in these companies, but they're not on the line in any reasonable way. If the project fails, the people who are going to pay for it and the people who are repaying the cost of the project are the ratepayers. It's not the company, it's not the investors in the company. They're safe. They can make money. They really can't lose a whole lot of money in the situation we've set up. As far as regulation goes, an important thing about it is that there's an assumption all the way through that the purpose of whatever it happens to be an electrical utility in these cases is to serve some kind of public use. And of course the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution says that land, private property cannot be taken for public use without just compensation. But it can be taken. And so all kinds of eminent domain issues come up and have been dealt with. 
And early on, public use was kind of a given. I mean, it was, electricity was an obvious good thing, just as being able to travel on railroads was an obvious good thing. And so it seemed reasonable to take property and land for that purpose. The issue of what just compensation would be has always been a tortured issue, usually the way it works, as it's worked here with the Addison County pipeline, is the people who want to do the pipeline, set up the electrical company, whatever it is, come and say, we need your land, and we can take it under the Constitution. And we've got regulators who say we can do that, and so here's a sum of money, just sell to us, because if you don't, we'll take you to court, you'll end up having court costs, and you'll end up getting a lot less money. Not a just and equitable situation. Public use, very tricky, especially when you get to where we are now. The country is fully electrified. Is it still a big deal? Do we really need more? There have been questions about need all the way along when you have a regulatory system that can take land for public use, does there also have to be a need? Or, again, looking at the situation in Vermont, we issue, the state issues, we don't, the state issues certificates of public good for its projects. What's included in the public good? For one thing, to meet that criteria, you have to meet the standards of the state's energy plan, comprehensive energy plan, the CEP. What does it say, for example, about gas? About gas, it's a long chapter, and in that chapter there are some very tepid warnings about the dangers of so-called natural gas as a producer of greenhouse gases. But then at the end of the chapter is a very powerful recommendation, recommendation one, number one. And that recommendation is that the state ought to expand natural gas infrastructure because it's clean, it's plentiful, and it's cheaper than oil. So to be a public good if you're building gas is already a given. The first thing this brings to mind is that we need different criteria about what a public good is. Natural gas is not clean, we all know that. When you take into account methane leaks, it's probably just as bad as coal, let alone oil. And what's more, it disrupts people's lives. And what's more beyond that is that as you build this infrastructure, you're dedicating yourself to 30 or even 40 years of using that fuel rather than what we would like instead, and that is renewables. Not a good thing. What we need to do, one thing we need, really need to concentrate on, is reforming the regulatory process and the agency itself. One place to begin is to get a reasonable definition of what a public good is so that it takes into account environmental con consequences. Number one among those would be uh, considering climate change. I'm running out of time already. Let me race on to a number of, of other things. We also need a situation where we can combat that recommendation in the comprehensive energy plan. Right now, you come in with a gas plan, it's going to work, it's going to be fine. If we pass no new fossil fuel infrastructure legislation, that immediately would be wiped out. It wouldn't solve all of our problems, but what it would do is clear the field so that if there really is a need to increase our use of electricity, as there would be if we start doing electric cars, heat pumps, and so on and so forth, then it would have to come from truly renewable sources, solar, some wind, mainly solar, and that implies the need for battery storage. Further, it's possible to consider more drastic actions. For example, I hope everyone is aware of the public trust suits that are going forward where groups, especially a group of children who started in Oregon, have been suing the federal government for not maintaining the trust that they have, the duty that they have to protect us. We could do that here in Vermont. 
We could, for example, sue the PUC for the very same reason, the Public Utilities Commission. They've done a terrible job of making sure that we don't suffer the consequences of climate change. And one further note about that, and I think this is really important and maybe not so as expensive as what I just mentioned, and that is we do not take into consideration anywhere in this country when we're building pipelines, when we're fracking gas, when we're doing those sorts of things, we don't take into consequences in local permitting what's going on at the fracking site or where people are experiencing pipelines nearby or where they're suffering from the health and safety issues that come up with that kind of infrastructure. We do have to take both of those things into account. Climate change counts for nothing in state regulatory agencies. They say, this doesn't apply here, it's not our problem, whatever happens to the climate as a result of what we're considering is tiny given the whole situation. That has to go. What's more, the health and safety of people in Nebraska, in Ohio, in North Dakota, is just as important, I think, to all of us as is the health and safety of people right here in Vermont, and there are health and safety issues right here in Vermont, as we all know really well. That's part of the story, there's more. Thank you. Next we have our visitor from all the way up in northern Maine, been traveling since very early this morning, Becky Layton Bartoviks, former chair and member of the executive committee of Sierra Club Maine since, not, since 2007. Uh, she lives on North Haven Island, Penobscot Bay, where she has a small organic sheep and vegetable farm. Thank you. Um, there's so many things that you just said that are rele uh, relevant in this subject, but, and I have a PowerPoint which uh, my friend Joan Sachs put together, but, so I'm just gonna run through it, but uh, just to say that the PUC, uh, Public Utilities Commission in Maine, is definitely um, subject to some of the same complaints that we have all over, and uh, we have a governor that um, is the predecessor to our president, so we have, we know we've been experiencing a pretty serious decline in, in environmental laws all over the state, so um, just to start with. Um, so uh, do, are you gonna push the forward or shall I do that? Uh, did you, did you, that, that'd be great, okay. Um, so this actually this is a picture of a transmission line. Um, with the New England Clean Energy Connect is a planned transmission line that is supposed to go through from uh, Colburn Gore to Lewiston and connect to the power grid, ISO power grid in New England. Um, and it's 95 miles of transmission line, uh, actually 54 new miles. And I think this is, a, this is the picture that CMP would give you for what a transmission line looks like. It looks beautiful. Neglects to tell you that they are spraying Roundup you know, all over it and once a year, and um, and that is taken, I think, in a perspective so that you don't really see what the what the horrible scouring of the environment is for it. Um, the next one, so um, it's a 145 mile long. This is the details. Uh, so it's the map. We can't really make this any bigger, but you can see I live right here. Some of these islands right here. Um, it's gonna be coming down from um, Canada. It's actually the beginning of where they were planning for the East-West Highway, is right here. Um, come down uh, through Lewiston and then connect to the grid, the ISO grid um, in, in Lewiston. Um, so 53 miles uh, and 950 million dollars of a transmission line, a new transmission line, um, on land that has been, actually they received the easements from the local towns and uh, small towns which are in pretty, still in economic stress since 2008. Um, and um, so it goes through the connection down to the power grid. Um, they would expand 92 other miles of transmission line and so I'm not exactly sure what that means but I think that means they have to increase the number of, um, of overhead power source to uh, the ISO New England and of course then they would have to be re- um, cutting the whole transmission line between Lewiston and Massachusetts. So vegetation, um, 
uh, and what would happen in the development of the corridor. Um, there is, uh, so we have, uh, next slide please. So we have a, a lot of questions about, oh uh, yeah, questions to be considered. Um, what are the visual and environmental impacts? The very beginning of this project, it goes over an iconic, um, the, the, in the Forks area, it's an iconic uh, area where uh, a lot of people do White River rafting. It's a beautiful, uh, untouched area of Maine. They either they're going to go under the river or they're going to go over the river. In either case, it will have significant environmental impact. Just right there. Um, the one of the details that I have. Let's see where is it. So it crosses. That's the Kennebec River Gorge there. The, the next thing is what impact will it have on our water and associated habitats? Um, it cuts through 263 wetlands. A hundred, it crosses 115 streams. Um, there are inland um, uh, wading bird habitat. There are uh, remote ponds, vernal mm -hmm. pools. So there's a huge amount of wetland um, destruction that is to happen. Um, and I'm going to go circle back to that uh, again in a minute. Um, so I'm not an expert on property value and, um, and tourism, but I can't imagine it's going to increase the property value or the tourism to the areas where the transmission lines are, even if it's just for, you know, well, it, I could go on. Never mind. Aesthetically, I think they're horrible. Um, the impact, and I, we're going to be hearing more about, oh, uh, uh, did I jump too fast? You jumped a little too fast. But okay. it, it, I will skip over that one. Um, so we are going to be hearing about what is happening in Labrador, uh, et cetera, with this. But I just to say that Sierra Club Maine strongly supports um, the native indigenous peoples and um, the impact to them. This is not a clean energy project. Quebec Hydro is going to be flooding air, a new area. It's going to be causing methane, um, me, um, uh, methane hydride, actually. And um, so it's, or methyl, I'm sorry, methylmercury and, and, and increased methane. And um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a deep concern to us and we stand with the Inuit, uh, the native folks. Um, this last one is that, um, is, the question really is, is this a, the wave of the future? More trans, large scale transmission lines? We have had a recent project in Maine, um, in Booth Bay, Maine, where we did a microgrid, uh, built a microgrid, and it was a, it was a test with Central Maine Power down one of our fingers in Booth Bay. And um, they, um, instead of bringing the transmission line, uh, created a way of, uh, of they did a lot of solar energy, they did a lot of efficiency work, and they also um, collected cold storage um, to, to offset air conditioning um, during the peak of the summer. And it um, saved somewhere in the neighborhood of $67 million um, of transmission cost down just one peninsula, and I think it's about 20 miles. I don't joke you correct me on that. So it's it's a you know it's, there, it's microgrids could save a lot of money. Plus you know there's a lot of other reasons to um, consider them. I'm hurrying because I think I only have ten minutes. Um, so there's an urgency to find reliable clean energy. There's nothing really reliable about what we can expect from the Canadian from uh, from Quebec Hydro because it's a, a Canadian government owned um, company. And so when Canada has, um, you know, a, a power shortage, they are not likely to, and it's probably going to be the same time that we do in, in New England, um, they are not likely to be giving us the power, uh, and they have, there's no promise that they will, nor is there a promise of, co of a reduction in cost. So it's not really a reliable source. Three minutes, okay. Um, uh, so I talked about the wetlands, I talked about the wading habitat. Let's go on to the next thing. So what's in it for me? What do we get? We get a lot of environmental damage and a lot of environmental costs. Um, do we get energy? Well, that's yet to be known. Whether we will get energy or not, there's a small amount of energy, but it's enough energy in some areas that will likely suppress the renewable energy, uh, burgeoning renewable energy field in, uh, in the state of Maine. It was the fastest growing 
industry that we had in Maine, and there are corporations that, you know, the one that we know the best um, started in a garage probably 10, 15 years ago, and they now have um, a corporate accounts, and they are, I think, 100, the last time I talked to the president, they have 160 employees, and but it's really reducing, you know, given that the environment, the climate is uh, with our governor, et cetera, is, is uh, not a good one for them. Uh, and this would just impact them further. Jobs, there may be some construction jobs, unlikely to be Maine construction jobs because the people who build transmission lines are not normally from Maine or we're not trained to do that. Um, taxes, there's a lot of bullying that's happening in the local communities. They are promising, um, this is what I want to go cycle back to the wetlands. They're promising oh, a lot of tax dollars going to each of the communities, but we have an in lieu fee program for mitigation of wetland destruction in Maine. Um, unfortunately, it's the first one in New England. We, we, we argued that we should not have it, but that means that even though the Clean, the Clean Water Act requires no net loss of wetlands, you can pay money to the state to <coughs> save wetlands that might be destroyed some other way, and then you can have at it with the other wetlands. So, um, so I suspect that the tax dollars or the dollars that are going to those communities are actually the dollars that they would be paying into mitigation. In any case, we have to know what is the source, what is the money, what are they really promising the communities. And you know, these a lot of these small towns don't have a lot of resources, and they don't really um, have the state supporting them and what the economic benefit of not doing this destruction in their community would be. So that's, those are just, we need to think about what the environmental economics is. Um, and let's see, um, so uh, I think that's pretty well. Pretty well. Um, I'm just gonna say that the only people who really benefit are the international, is the international corporation that owns Central Maine Power. Um, and they're the shareholders and the CEOs. So uh, it's not likely to benefit our state. Uh, a short period of time. <laughs> um, so we have um, actually entered into an unusual partnership with, um, as, as stakeholders in this, with some uh, power companies that are, you know, there's a biomass uh, natural gas power company and um, a, so there are three power companies that are, are also interveners in this that are small scale power companies, uh, local power companies. And so um, if you have further questions about that, I can, can answer some more. And I just want to mention that the, there are four, um, there's a bipartisan group of legislators who wrote um, as to the Pu Public Utility Commission opposing this, and that's quite unusual. Um, in our state right now. There are four of them from the utilities and um, the Energy Utilities com uh, Committee, Joint Committee, and the Natural Resources Committee, just saying they do not see how this is going to benefit the state of Maine. So ask me questions further. Thank you very much. So next we have our video presentation. And I saw there were two people speaking uh, there, but the, the one person I have information about is Roberta Benefio, and which one is she? On the right. On the right. Um, she's been a river advocate for over 20 years. Uh, she has been the river keeper for the Grand River Keeper Labrador since 2011, has a BA in Environmental Studies from Mount, Ad Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. Uh, the owner operator of dog kennels in Labrador called Goose Bay Critter Sitters so she can keep the lights on while volunteering to try to save the rivers. She loves canoeing the river and she says, but alas, it could soon be three long flat reservoirs. No fun paddling that for 10 days. Here they are. Welcome to the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric project. Not green, not clean, not cheap but who pays the price presentation. I'd like us first to uh, welcome Roberta and she will introduce herself. Hi, I'm Roberta Benefield and I'm with Waterkeeper Alliance and the Grand River Keeper Labrador. I'm the river keeper for that group and I'm also on the standing committee of the Labrador Land Protectors, welcome. 
and I'm Tracy Doherty. I'm a Labrador land protector and Grand River Keeper. I'm also a student of the Inuit Bachelor of Education program, which is focused on land-based uh, edu education. I'm also an Inatsiavut beneficiary. I want to introduce you to our beloved Grand River. It's also known as the Mistashipu by the Inu, and it's got the names Hamilton River and Churchill River, which speaks to the colonial history in our area. There's already one hydroelectric uh, project on the river. Uh, most of that power is sold to Hydro-Quebec under a 1969 contract that's at Churchill Falls. Two more dams are proposed. Muskrat Falls is almost completed and Gull Island is in the works. Muskrat Falls is near completion. The, our precious river is 856 kilometers. It's the longest river in Atlantic Canada. That's 532 miles. It drains an area of 79,800 kilometers squared, 30,800 square miles. There's already methylmercury contamination in larger fish from the original hydro project. And now I'd like us to look at what are we seeing as the issues that need to be addressed with the Muskrat Falls project. Um, so it's this methylmercury contamination that we're very concerned about. More dams equals more methylmercury, and it's poisoning the traditional food web of the Inuit, the Innu, and all residents of the Happy Valley Goose Bay area. Also, this methylmercury is traveling through Lake Melville up the inlet to the Inuit community of Rigolet who consume country food. It's a staple in their lives. The Harvard study confirms methylmercury poisoning in humans from consumption of fish, birds, and seal. Um, recommendations are on the table, but have not been implemented. The North Spur is another major issue of this project. Um, the North Spur is a natural dam, one of three dams proposed and already being built. Um, this particular area is fraught with quick clay, which is um, a marine clay that's prone to liquefaction. A proper risk assessment has not been done. In our opinion, we've had uh, an expert from Sweden help us with this project, and he has recommended a proper risk assessment and the government has refused to do it. If, uh, if this dam should break, either one of the three dams, the communities of Happy Valley Goose Bay would go partially underwater. And a map behind us is from NALCOR's own studies showing how much of the community of Happy Valley Goose Bay would be flooded. The community of Mud Lake, however, would be devastated completely. It would go totally underwater. As an Indigenous person, I'm also, uh, I'll say I'm an Indigenous environmentalist. I'm concerned that um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is not being respected in our community. Um, at the joint review panel, we had countless, well, I shouldn't say countless, we had 86 recommendations um, regarding this project. Uh, and they were not implemented. The UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, calls for free prior informed consent. And I'll add, in most circles, we're talking about deep, meaningful consent. Um, some of that began, however, uh, and was reflected in the joint review panel, but as I say, those recommendations were not honored. So the UNDRIP uh, recommendations that uh, Indigenous people who have been dispossessed of their land and our connections to our land, um, this needs to be addressed. The price of this project has doubled since it began. The original quote to get the project sanctioned was 6.2 billion. It's now at 12.7 billion. Uh, now Core Energy is a crown corporation, so the shareholders of this project are us, the citizens of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. We have to pay that bill. That's 78 billion dollars over 50 years, spread among 500,000 people. We're extremely worried that our province is going to actually be bankrupt. 
So when we consider these, you know, really serious issues that need to be addressed, what do each of you suggest could be possible ways to address these issues? Well, we have to be, we, let's not be afraid to engage in difficult, uncomfortable conversations. First off, we have the Independent Scientific Review by the Independent Expert Advisory Committee, and they are recommending, well, there are four recommendations. The one that we consider the most important is that the cleared areas um, be removed of all the topsoil and that the wetlands be capped. This uh, needs to be done to mitigate as much as possible the methyl mercury contamination. That uh, report was tabled in April 2018, this year, the spring of this year. However, the government has yet to act on this expensive study. So with regards to the North Spur, we have connected with a Dr. Stig Bernander in Sweden, who has given us um, the answer to uh, how a risk assessment should be done and what studies have to be done in order to tell whether or not the North Spur will hold under pressure and under uh, uh, extreme uh, water pressure from the upper Churchill or from the uh, river. Um, we want Dr. Bernander's studies and the risk assessment to be taken up by the government in Nalcor, and they have refused to do so. And coming back to UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, it has to be recognized that um, with self-government governance in the works, we're new nations. Um, we've been oppressed people for uh, centuries now. Um, economics is where we're heading as stakeholders to take our rightful place as the original peoples on this land, but it's a process and we're evolving. And the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples helps us to respect all of us as individuals within our nations and the voices have to be heard. Um, I, through the studies that I've been doing, I'm just learning a lot of this myself. And things that used to be in place, like clans, have now have a modern spin. It can't only be the business voice in our community that is heard. All the voices have to be heard. And that includes our children and our children's children, the seven generations to come. That is a fundamental uh, value of our people. And as an Anunziavut beneficiary, I want to say that in our constitution, we are responsible to treasure our lands, our waters, our ice. That's our responsibility. And for everyone who's in attendance for this presentation today, what do you feel could be actions that they can take right where they are to help with these issues that we're seeing? There's a lot of research that's been done into energy, uh, sustainable energy. It is doable. We need to get behind local projects. Um, this, there's so much now that has to do with energy democracy, local ownership of small projects, solar and wind, it can be done. The, these projects, it has been proven, will outperform these mega projects. They won't be boom and bust. They'll be maintainable. And those long-term jobs will come from maintaining these local projects. It's environmental justice and it's energy democracy to get these pro small projects that are leaving a, a, a small footprint on our environment and owned by the local people. Local people will have decision-making power. That's what we've got to aim for. And what we'd ask you folks to do is to lobby. Lobby and understand and learn about mega hydro and what the effects are. Lobby against the transmission lines that are coming into your territories and into your states 
from uh, Canada, uh, these transmission lines are bringing power from our rivers. And by the way, there's about 116 more rivers uh, slated in Canada to be dammed. As a matter of fact, there are eight more rivers in Labrador alone that have already been uh, assessed for hydro projects. So we don't need any more major hydro projects. We don't need them in Labrador, we don't need them in Canada, and we don't need them anywhere on the planet. So don't, no longer accept power from any mega hydro because they are not clean, they're not green, and the people who live in these communities pay the ultimate price, sometimes even with their lives. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Pass this around so folks can take a look at this map and get a sense of the geography. We have Labrador and Newfoundland, Church uh, of Falls, the original dam is here, and the dam, the new project that we were hearing about is up here. So I'll just pass this around so folks can get a closer look. I mentioned at the outset that we have a special last minute guest from Montreal. Uh, Phil Raffles is a journalist. Uh, energy policy analyst uh, many years ago, 25 years ago, when many of us here were involved in opposing an even larger scale project that was proposed by Hydro-Quebec that was going to be uh, sending electricity uh, to Vermont and all of the Northeast, uh, led to a huge mobilization that eventually led to the cancellation of that project. Phil was one of our consistent, reliable sources on what was really going on behind the scenes in Quebec during that whole struggle. Uh, Phil is mostly here to answer questions, but uh, can just offer some brief comments to uh, update us on what's happening in Quebec. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I don't really have any prepared comments, so I can, I can talk to you about Hydro Quebec. I can also talk to you about this uh, Muscat Falls project, which I've been working on for five years with Renner and Keeper. Um, Muscat Falls is really a catastrophe of a project in every way. It's, uh, it, it shouldn't have gotten started, and at the time we were the only ones saying that, and now everyone's saying it. Uh, but it's almost completed, and no one really knows who's going to pay for it or how. Uh, the system that's in place is that uh, electricity consumers on the island of Newfoundland will pay for it. C recent estimate from Nalcor is that will mean doubling of electricity rates. Uh, as soon as it comes online. And it's designed with a power purchase agreement with an escalating purchase price. So the purchase price goes up by 2% every year to uh, I forget how many dollars a kilowatt hour in 50 years from now. And it's clear, I mean, everyone now agrees that, that, that people can't pay that much for it. Even if they do, they'll leave or they'll, uh, you know, buy wood stoves if they want you know. There's this enormous electricity catastrophe that's just that we're just seeing the, um, it was supposed to be in service by now actually, now they're saying 2020. And this is aside from the problems that Roberta and uh, Stace were talking about, about methyl mercury and the lead spur. The spur is, is a serious engineering question. Maybe everything will be fine, maybe it won't. And it doesn't look like we're really going to know until we're going to the list. Um, Initially, maybe just a little bit of the history of this. So the Churchill Falls project was built in the 60s, uh, essentially by Hydro Quebec uh, and essentially by the mine, but uh, through a, a, a contract with the Newfoundland government, with uh, CFL Co, which is a crown corporation. And um, it's a subject of enormous resentment in, in the Labrador because the price of power under this contract was, well, at the beginning, it's gotten even lower. And, but the reason for that is it was really sort of designed to mimic the economics of building a hydro project. Hydro Quebec said, well, if we build Churchill Falls instead of building the James Bay, then, and we're going to buy most of the power and put up all the money and do all the work and take all the risk, then the economics should look somewhat similar. So it's, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, but the result is that for decades now, Newfoundland has deeply resented Quebec for what they see is just taking off with our best resource and all the money. You know, most of the 
all these profits that were really not foreseen when it was built, but 95% of them were staying in Quebec. Um, and the Lower Churchill project was seen as Newfoundland's way of getting back. This time we're going to do it ourselves, this time we're going to keep the money. That was a, a driving force in Newfoundland politics for, for a really long time. All kinds of different projects were started and, and proposed and developed. And when they started the environmental assessment of the Lower Churchill project, it consisted of these two dams, Muskrat Falls, the smaller one, and Gull Island, the bigger one. And the plan was clearly to use Quebec's transmission and bring the power through Quebec and stuff up in New York and New England. And another long story, it didn't quite work out. They sort of screwed up their approach to Quebec. Quebec does have an open access transmission system. Anyone that wants to can transmit power. It's a question of timing and reservations. They got the reservation first, but they ended up losing it because they didn't write the right letter at the right time. <laughs> And then, so then Hydro Quebec had the reservation just after that, so their power from the OMN gets to use this capacity, and it would cost a fortune for, for uh, now for to build the line. And at this point, Danny Williams, who was an extremely charismatic premier, said, I have the answer. We have a new solution. This solves all our problems. This is going to make, you know, make gold <laughs> and flow in the streets, uh, which is we're, we're just going to build Muscat Falls, and we're going to build it for Newfoundland. Because Newfoundland has a power problem of its own, a big part of their winter power comes from uh, an oil burning plant called Holyoke, very old and dirty and expensive oil plant. And you know, this was at the time when oil prices were going up and that they were going to go up for a long time. And we'll build Muskrat Falls and we'll build a transmission line to the island and we'll use Muskrat Falls power to shut down home. And we're going to save phenomenal amounts of money, first of all, for not having to refurbish it and put in scrubbers and you know, make it into a modern plant. And secondly, the oil that we're not going to burn for 50 years. So this is really a magnificent solution. And then on top of that, he negotiated with Nova Scotia to build another underwater transmission line from Newfoundland to Nova Scotia. Because Muscat Falls is far more power than the island Newfoundland can use. And as many that there's a thousand pages of contracts between, <laughs> between Nalcor and Nova Scotia Power, its subsidiary uh, to the maritime line. It was a phenomenally complicated system. We then got a financial loan guarantee from the federal government. That's a pretty good one. But at the end of the day, the way it's all structured is the consumers in Newfoundland who really have the cost burden. Because Nova Scotia is essentially getting, uh, well, first of all, they're getting a block of free power in exchange for building the transmission line. And, and secondly, they got, because not what they essentially promised it, they got the right to buy a lot more power at market rates. So once this thing is in service, um, the power will definitely go to the um, Some of it will be used there. The idea was, the initial plan was that about a fifth of it would be used at the beginning and it would gradually increase. So 10 years or 20 years later, they'd use all of it. At that point, that's just, that seems pretty unlikely. It's very unlikely that the Midland economy is going to grow at the same time as this power is a double uh, And so the power then will go to Nova Scotia. Now the question is, I think from the point of view of, of exports, uh, what happens then? Frankly, I think mostly, most of the power is simply going to be consumed in Nova Scotia, who, which burns a lot of coal. The last uh, province in the East that burns coal, and uh, they have a really good deal. <laughs> They're going to essentially get this power, not for what it costs to produce it, but for what it would have cost them to import power from, from Boston. And uh, there may be some left that's exported uh, through Maine. And, uh, but I think that's going to be probably the most of the small. Uh, so it's, it's, really, it's, a, it's a really tragic situation, and it's almost a politically tragic situation, where this desire, profound desire, to finally have our own power plant instead of Quebec's is turning into a project that's, gonna, that's really sinking. And now what they're talking about, so ratepayers can't pay it, so the government's going to have to pay it. Well, what does that mean? That's the same people. <laughs> the same people who weren't doing that for the people. So the other little bit that, that I'd like to talk to you about is, is Hydro Quebec, um, which is a very successful kind of corporation. Um, with the uh, transformation of electric markets in the 90s, ISOs and uh, the hourly markets. Um, 
Quebec also transformed its electric system, but in a different way. It put in place what is, I don't know if it's so common here, but it's well recognized by FERC, uh, functional separation. So instead of breaking apart their power company, as most of the Northeastern power companies did, selling off generation and becoming just a, a utility, a distribution utility, Hydro-Quebec took the approach of dividing its company into separate divisions. So it has a distribution division, which sells power to Quebec, almost. It has a transmission division, which is an open access transmission carrier that has a, it has a transmission tariff, a lot like the one that FERC requires in the US, not exactly. But, uh, um, and then they have a generation division. And it was at the same time that they set up a regulator. There's never been a regulation, right? So now what happens is that there's a, there's a Public Utilities Regulator, Public Utilities Energy, which uh, essentially has to approve any significant decisions by HP distribution and by HP transmission. But HP generation is excluded from that. This is due to a transformation that took place in the year 2000. And as a result, HQ generation is really uh, a very secretive entity. It obviously communicates with the government, communicates with, 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 with the Premier, and probably the Minister of Natural Resources, but it doesn't really have any obligation to communicate with Quebec. So what we know, actually, in many ways, Americans know more about HTTPs activities than we do. <laughs> because there are disclosure requirements here, and I learned all kinds of things about having Quebec from reading American publications and, and regulations. But one, so, but one thing is, so since it wasn't regulated, I had to write HTTP called HTTP, HTTP production. Um, didn't need regulatory approval, doesn't, and doesn't need regulatory approval to build dams. So the big project that's still under construction, La Romaine, was started in 2009, I think. It's, uh, it's four reservoirs, four dams. The first two units have been in service for several years, and the last two are still under construction. The thing is that this was all designed at the time when it looked like power prices were high and going higher forever. And if you read the the economic forecast that justified that one, and they showed New England power prices in 2020 as being something, I forget exactly, but you know, 20 cents on peak and 16 cents off peak a kilowatt hour. And, you know, at those kind of rates, the, the, the economic argument is, is you know, it's it's a good money. you can make money with this project. But at three and four cents a kilowatt hour, you can't. And this is an issue that's sort of been in the background of Quebec for, for a long time. And because there really was a choice whether or not to go, to, to go ahead with the, the, the upper dams in the system. And it's really hard to see how they make it make sense. Because really, you're producing power. There's been a lot of debate and a lot of confusing, a lot of confusion about what this power is actually going to cost. But it's somewhere on the order of seven or eight or nine or ten cents a kilowatt hour to cost to produce. And to sell that in the market that, you know, better than I do, but our prices in New England now are in the three or four and five cent range, right? thanks to fracking, thanks to natural gas. Uh, so how does this make sense? Sorry? Well, but the residential rate includes the cost of delivery, the cost of transmission. I'm talking about the wholesale power rate. Okay. Yeah, the ISO. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, but on the other hand, it's you know the system is so large, and they have such a large uh, amount of old hydropower that costs practically nothing, that it's it's not a catastrophic situation. It's a it's a problematic situation. It's not catastrophic. Unlike Google, which really is catastrophic. But the situation then is that they, they're building demand in Quebec has been falling. Bitcoin and a whole other talk about now about Bitcoin, uh, which is subject of current regulatory proceedings both in Quebec and in New Zealand. Uh, I'm actually curious to know how Bitcoin is being regulated here. I know New York State and its powers uh, uh, got regulatory proof. But what appears to be happening is an HQP, which is its business model was to develop a surplus. Its business model was to build more power than it needed in order to export it. And uh, that's going forward. And so there's a lot of power both today and still under development which needs to find a home. And 
that's why the selection to get in. Thanks so much. Um, we have two more speakers, and then we'll open it up for questions and, and discussion. Uh, first, Steve Crowley, who's been a campaigner and educator since high school, an activist with the Clamshell Alliance, where we first met more than 40 years ago, uh, VNRC, the Sierra Club, and other organizations. He served as the chair of the Sierra Club's National Climate and Energy Campaign and as coordinator for the Vermont Coalition of St. James Bay, the struggle we were talking about just a bit ago. Uh, Steve is currently the chair of the Energy Committee for the Vermont Sierra Club, and he'll be talking with us about carbon accounting for electricity imports. Thanks, Brian. So I, I think this is going to be quick, and uh, I'm not going to dwell a lot on numbers in spite of the fact that that's what this is about. So, uh, and I want to say this, this is kind of a work in progress because I think what, what, I'm, what I'm hoping to do with, with this uh, slide showing with figuring this stuff out is to find some hooks that we can use here in Vermont to uh, try to have some influence over this in the future. Uh, you know, we get like a quarter of our electricity from Hydro-Quebec right now until the year, I think it's 2030. Uh, so that's, that's a lot of power. And I don't think we have a lot of influence there. But uh, there are a few areas that I thought I would try to address. One is uh, uh, carbon impacts of these direct purchases of electricity from Hydro-Quebec. Second issue is RECs, which are not Electricity exactly is just the you know the renewable attributes of the electricity, and then third, uh, how this might relate, how the question of accurate accounting for carbon could relate to Regent, the regional greenhouse gas emission. So uh, I say 24 percent of our power, 1.3 terawatt hours a year, is the is the number, uh, and it's considered renewable in some senses here in Vermont. By law, it's considered not directly Hydro-Quebec power, but large dams. And it's, it's allowed to be counted as part of our renewable energy standard. And when people talk about uh, our statewide goal of 90% renewable by 2050, I don't think we would have that standard if it weren't for the fact that this, uh, you know, uh, fake renewable power is sitting there. Uh, and to me, this whole question of whether this is renewable or not is, uh, you know, in, in a way it's a twist of language. People talk about the water continually flowing and they you know we'll talk dramatically about how it's powered by the sun and it's a water cycle and everything, but, but it's not just the water that is part of the resource here, it's, it's the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, our regulatory system has not really, I don't think it's tested this question yet. Uh, and I, so I'm, uh, I've been lobbying some people to see if we could bring that, for, bring that forward, you know, in the right venue. Can we really question this idea about whether it's just the water or is it really, what is the resource that we're talking about here? Um, so the second question is the carbon question. And this one does not come up really in our, direct regulatory system, but it does come up, uh, comes up under Reggie, and it, and it comes up uh, if, you know, if, if we want to get real about dealing with climate change, it doesn't matter whether we call it renewable or not. What really matters is whether it's producing carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. So this, there are kind of three elements of this. I'm not going to dwell on the numbers here, but they exist. Uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, they're, they're always come in ranges. Uh, but what I've found, and this is covering a lot of different places in research over the last 20 years, is first of all, you have the lost carbon sink. You know what I mean by that? You have, you know, 10,000 acres, 10,000 square miles, excuse me, of forest land, which you would expect is sitting there soaking up carbon from the atmosphere as it grows. Some in the plants, some in the soil, it's soaking up, that's the sink of carbon. Uh, and it works out to, you know, there's a number there, a couple of grams per square meter per day. Uh, if you take all of the, if you do the math and work out how, many, how much electricity is produced by those reservoirs, 
and uh, divide that out, you get to be something like 120 grams for every kilowatt hour that gets produced. That is the lost carbon. You imagine every year that forest would have been soaking up that much carbon, but it's not, and that's electricity we get out of it. So something like 120 grams for every kilowatt hour. And then there's the <coughs> reservoir emissions. It varies a lot how much, you know, a new reservoir produces more than an old reservoir. Uh, but that drops off, you know, you hear that a lot, but it drops off much more dramatically in a tropical reservoir than it does in a boreal forest reservoir, or especially a peat reservoir, uh, because the cycles go much more quickly when it's hot. Um, and they've been building up and building up and building up for so long in these boreal forests and peatlands that there's a lot there. So, uh, you know, where they're adding new reservoirs, that bumps it up. When they're sitting on old reservoirs, it tends to go down. But if you do an average, if you look at, you know, the area of different, you know, the size of the different reservoirs and, and how much the different reservoirs are putting out, uh, you can come up with an average, and it's remarkably close to the lost sink. It's rounded off a bit here. Uh, so they're both coming in about 120 grams per kilowatt hour. Uh, what I have not looked at, but uh, what some people have said, with, and I think they underestimate both the sink and the emissions, the reservoir emissions, but some people have said that the biggest impact from hydro is in the infrastructure. I think that actually may be true in some facilities where you don't have a vast reservoir. If you've got a steep uh, channel that's dammed up and, and maybe you run it on a run of the river uh, mode as opposed to ponding a huge reservoir, uh, then I think maybe the infrastructure dominates the carbon emissions. But not for these vast, not when you're uh, cutting 10,000 square miles of forest. So I don't know what the right number is there. But in any case, you add those up and it's about 250 to 300, uh, let's see if I have that on the next slide, 250 to 300 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent for every uh, kilowatt hour of power. Just for comparison here, I'm recognizing that this is another fake number, but uh, if you're just counting the direct emissions of burning methane, you get 400 grams. And I, I'm sure that varies a lot too, based on what kind of plant and what else is the plant for, and is it old or new, and, and, and all that. But uh, we also know that that number should be twice as high now, three minutes. Um, you know, as, as Phil was saying, you know, not far from where Cole, or who said that? Um, so that gives you. It, I guess you'd have to say that it still comes in as lower carbon emissions than fossil fuel. But it's certainly not zero. And uh, I don't think I have this on the slide, but if you add that up for the 1.3 terawatt hours that Vermont imports every year, it comes out to be something like 300,000 metric tons a year of carbon emissions. So. Uh, you know, we don't talk about that much in regulation, but uh, we should. Um, so, a couple of questions here. Uh, you know, expansion is, is on the table, and so newer <laughs> reservoirs have higher emissions. Um, in one report which was done for CLF, Conservation Law Foundation, the Synapse Group and, uh, said that uh, suggested that Hydro-Quebec, and I don't know if you may know about this, uh, is when it's, you know, uh, there are times when Hydro-Quebec is actually importing fossil-generated power to make up for the, uh, you know, hydro power that it's selling to the south. I don't know if that's true. It was in their report, do you know anything about that? Uh, well, yeah, the hydro does import uh, for two reasons. The, during during certain hours, HQ Distribution buys power in the U.S. to, to serve Quebec needs, so mm -hmm. small amounts over the year. Uh, but HQP also is free to buy power if it can, uh, if it can <coughs> buy now and sell later for more. So essentially, using the reservoirs as storage. 
uh, and insofar as the system power. So uh, it's not clear that when we buy that power, it's actually uh, not being replaced with fossil fuel power. Uh, next question, I'll try to be quick here, is about renewable energy credits. Is everybody familiar with the idea of these renewable energy credits? I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But you know, there's the idea is that it could be, and I think there's some value to these arguments that it that can be an efficient way of deploying renewable energy, uh, but it's fraught with uh, problems. Uh, first of all, when we are supposedly purchasing renewable energy credits to uh, to be able to say that we're kind of supporting renewable energy. Uh, well, it's, it's just not true with Hydro Quebec or other mega hydros because it's not carbon neutral. We're not helping the uh, climate situation at all. Uh, and the, the second thing I want to ask is if we buy RECs, it's one thing if you purchase the power, it's real power, but if you're buying RECs and Hydro Quebec just has, the, it's, not, it's not really incentivizing anything. It's just paying, it's writing a check to Canada. For, to be able to say that we have these wrecks. It's not actually incentivizing anything. Uh, so uh, let me just give a quick example here. This is Burlington Electric. This is how they claim the light blue is, well, they claim to be 100% uh, renewable with their energy portfolio. But most of it, as you see, is REC purchases, the light blue. This is the real story for, for Burlington Electric. Uh, I don't know if you can read that, I can't. Nuclear, natural gas, coal, distillates, oil, uh, and over here is the, the, the light blue is the renewable, the real renewable energy. So, so uh, that's Burlington Electric. And they're a little more extreme with this than most of Vermont, because Vermont generally does this. Most utilities are selling the uh, renewable energy that they actually generate as credits down south and covering it up with uh, hydrocarbon purchases. Finally, just a quick point, uh, and this is totally separate, but it's still about carbon. Uh, you know, uh, the Reggie program has all of all the power plants over 25 megawatts purchasing carbon carbon allowances. And an auction costs them something like a little under four dollars a ton these days. Um, but they're, for for natural gas, first of all, they're they're not counting hydro at all. But they don't count out of uh, you know they don't count imports anyway. But uh, it's time that they double their accounting for methane because we know methane uh, is producing twice as much as we think, and that might be it. So. The point of this is that we're, this whole system masks, it, it makes us think we're doing a good job when we really have a tremendous opportunity to transition to a clean energy economy. And it's really denying us that opportunity. So that's it. Thank you. The final speaker is Rachel Smolker, the co-director of Biofuel Watch, an organization uh, based both here in Vermont and in the UK that works internationally on climate, energy, and land use issues. Rachel's on the board of the Global Forest Coalition and the steering committee of the Campaign to Stop Genetically Engineered Trees, uh, which was also founded here in Vermont by some old friends of ours. Uh, she's been active over the past few years fighting the Vermont Gas uh, Addison County Pipeline as a founder of the Hinesburg based group Protect Your Prags Park. Rachel has a PhD in biology and worked previously as a field biologist and ecologist. Thanks, everybody. So, I was asked to speak here just sort of very generally about the topic of false solutions, which is actually a really huge topic <laughs> when you're talking about climate change. And um, I wasn't quite sure where should I start. And I kept thinking, well, you know, 
there's so many. I mean, obviously, big hydro is a false solution, right? We pretend that there's no methane emissions, and we pretend that it's clean, and we trade these wrecks around and uh, and and account it as having you know zero emissions and being really great, which is very much the case for biomass, which is the thing that I've been focused on for the last uh, well over a decade now, um, and. In, uh, most policies, biomass is considered to have zero emissions, right? Because if you cut down trees and burn them for electricity, the, the theory goes, somebody can plant a new tree and the new tree will absorb that same amount of carbon, which is totally absurd, right? First of all, you, you know, a 200-year-old tree you can burn in about two seconds, even in a small facility like the one we have here in McNeil in Burlington. Um, and it would take 200 years for that carbon to get re into, assuming that a new tree actually was planted and did grow successfully and that if you did that repeatedly, uh, the soil wouldn't get so depleted over time that trees wouldn't grow there anymore anyway. So the entire logic of it makes you know, very little sense. And yet, in, the fact, in spite of the fact that we have been fighting that for over a decade now, and there's a massive peer-reviewed literature uh, the, um, the, the, the policies that are supporting that here in the state of Vermont or uh, in, in pretty much every state, Massachusetts has done a few good things, right, Meg? Uh, <laughs> but um, pretty much everywhere, the policies continue to pretend that uh, burning biomass is climate neutral, has no impact whatsoever on climate, and is therefore favored and subsidized along with all of the other you know, renewable energy uh, sources like solar and wind, which don't require you to burn anything on go ongoing, <clears throat> don't require any ongoing fuel. And so, you know, it's the subsidizing of it that actually keeps it going because none of these facilities, biomass facilities, would be viable without those uh, massive amounts of subsidies. So now we're in this position where, and, and, and I should say too that this came about in part through uh, a, a funny accounting thing uh, on how, when the IPCC and the, and the UN were deciding how should we uh, account for carbon emissions from the land sector and the energy sector. Sorry about that. And, um, and because of some funny things which we don't really need to go into, it, it came about that um, this carbon neutral myth was sort of perpetuated. Uh, and now we're in this, you know, decades later with all this peer-reviewed literature showing all the carbon emissions that come from deforestation when you burn biomass, etc. But we still have all the policies in place and now we have the IPCC, uh, which is, I am party to their new report writing because I have the honor of being a reviewer for them. And what do they say in their, in their new report on land mitigation? They say, well, we can reduce emissions in the atmosphere uh, if in order to achieve the goal of uh, you know, two, two degrees or less of warming, we need to not only reduce the amount of emissions we put into the atmosphere, but we need to actually find a way to take stuff that's already in the atmosphere back out. And we don't really know how to do that, but we have this great idea, bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration, right? Bex. So remember clean coal? <laughs> Clean coal is a dirty lie. Anybody remember hearing that? Like back in the 90s, it's still with us. Clean coal is still with us. And uh, is based on this idea that you can capture the carbon emissions coming out of a smokestack and bury them underground somewhere safely away and uh, out of uh, harm's way from the atmosphere. And so BEX is basically the same idea, but since uh, supposedly it's a carbon neutral and a new tree will grow and offset any that happened during burning, when you take it out and bury it underground, you're getting a carbon negative. Okay, this is the IPCC saying that, right? The International Panel on Climate Change, the people who informed us and do inform us so effectively and so well, the biggest scientific collaborative effort ever to happen on the planet among human beings that has done so well in telling us about what the impacts of climate change are likely to look at. But they have stepped into the realm of like, so now what do we do? And they have their working group on mitigation. And their working group on mitigation is populated by, well, you think things like econ uh, ecologists and biologists and stuff? No, economists. So the economists have stepped into the mitigation game for the IPCC, and they are promoting this uh, idea of bioenergy and carbon capture and sequestration. You know what their other great idea is for the land, uh, uh, land sector emissions, by the way? The other great idea is that we should uh, encourage the use of wood as a replacement for concrete. 
So maybe we can build a big mega dams out of wood instead of concrete. I don't know what they're thinking, but this is their other big um, thing. And, and, and the UN is now uh, promoting, if you go onto the UNFCC website, they have this new promo about how the fashion industry, the fashion industry, according to them, and I was shocked to hear this actually, I'm not, I'm not a big dresser, but I just didn't have any idea, that the fashion industry is responsible for more emissions of greenhouse gases than aviation and uh, uh, shipping, all aviation and shipping emissions combined, fashion industry, right? Just the making of the materials and the shipping of materials and all of that. Uh, I, I don't know how they made that, that assessment, but it was a shock for me to hear that. So now the UNFCC has a solution. We're gonna make fashions out of trees. There's this wonderful promo video of this woman who's going to Finland and she's gonna try on a new dress that's made out of wood and wood fibers and it's great. And this is, of course, not totally new. Uh, the fashion industry has made uh, fabrics like, I guess it's, what is it, rayon or lycra or something is made yeah. out of wood fibers, rayon. Um, so it's not totally new making stuff up. But are we gonna be, promoting the use of wood to make electricity, make all our fashions, and now we have the bioeconomy, this whole economy where we can make anything out of, anything that's made out of petroleum chemically, you know, could be potentially made out of wood. Um, and and, and the, chemist, the chemicals industry, um, you know, all of our building materials, et cetera, et cetera, everybody is basically saying, hey, we have these forests over here, and we can basically just make everything really clean and green by making it out of wood instead. And then on the other hand, they're over there saying, oh, the most important thing we can do to mitigate emissions is to protect our forests, right? So we have reducing emissions from de uh, deforestation and forest degradation, red, this whole policy that's being debated, and money's getting poured into it, and they're trying to figure out ways to make it you know, good for the human rights of people uh, who, who are forest dependent, uh, especially indigenous peoples. So it's such an absurd, as such an absurd thing. I wanted to just very briefly touch on this slide because uh, I think one of the things about uh, Big Hydro, of course, is that it's generally classed as a renewable uh, uh, energy. This is data from the um, uh, Energy Information Administration on US uh, energy, I think it's consumption and consumption by energy source in 2016, and it's not changed that much. Um, and what you see is that uh, in energy consumption, the red here is petroleum, the, uh, the blue, light blue is natural gas, the dark blue is coal, and this is nuclear, and 10% of that, that little green piece there, is all renewable consumption in the US. And when you break that down, what do you see? You see 24% of our renewable energy in the US is from big hydro. And what do you see? You see, you see all of these right here, the green, the brown, and the light blue is all bioenergy. It's biofuels, biomass waste, and burning wood. And up here, the yellow is wind, and that tiny little blue thing up there is solar, and the tiny little line at the very top is geothermal. So to get to a, quote, 100% renewable energy future anytime very soon is gonna take some really serious reconsideration about how we use energy and how we make energy and what we use it for. And there's just no way around that. <laughs> you know, I like to also embrace the idea that we can have little microgrids and we'll, we'll, you know, put solar panels on our roofs and it'll all be really good, but it's not gonna happen without some really um, drastic reconsideration of, of how much energy we use and what we use. So, I wanted to try something new. I get really depressed working on this stuff a lot. <coughs> uh, I have a, a handout here that I, um, that I uh, helped to put together a long time ago. It's called Good Winked in the Hot House. It was put together by folks at Rising Tide and Carbon Trade Watch. And this was, I mean, the climate justice movement at the international level and otherwise was, um, has, has put a lot of its energy, not, um, you think, into like coming up with all the great things that we ought to do, but rather pushing back against all the false solutions that have been promoted at every level from local to international. And it's got beautiful artwork and it touches on a lot of things that, you know, if I were to go through a laundry list of false solutions, we'd be here all night. But a lot of them are in here and they include things like climate geoengineering and uh, carbon marketing and carbon trade uh, schemes and nukes and various others and biofuels. So I'm going to just put these up down here and I hope you'll take them at least for the art, if not, you know, for bedtime reading. 
So I do get kind of tired working on this stuff sometimes. And coming and being like the talking head and always. And I thought today I would try something really different, which I'm very nervous about, and I've been sweating all afternoon over. But I woke up this morning and thinking like, oh, and all this stuff started sort of fitting into my head in a little bit of like a, a wrap almost. And uh, my daughter said, no, you can't. Mom, that's, you don't wrap, Mom. <laughs> she said, basically, she said, old, girl, old white girls don't wrap. It's cultural appropriation, and we live in a very divided nation. So please forgive my transgression. I don't mean to make a bad impression. But sometimes I need to find a rhyme, and I need to find a beat, just to dissipate a little bit of my heat. Because my head gets so full of crap, sometimes I really need to rap. <laughs> False solutions is more pollution, misinformation, and toxic collusion, all done just to maintain this convenient economic illusion. Certified green products, carbon taxes, carbon trade, markets cannot save us from the very problem that they made. <laughs> Buy an offset, plant a tree, just don't blame the corporations because it's all about you and me. Change your light bulbs, eat less meat. Take shelter from the heat. We can fly our planes on palm oil, mix up coal with wood, put a tiger in your tank and corn ethanol under your hood. Clean coal, clean gas, big hydro and biomass. Are you telling me that's what we get when we kick fossil fuel ass? Stop the lying, stop deceiving, stop trying to sell us so much crap. Stop the corporate CEOs getting rich and thick and fat while the world negotiates for decades over this and this and that. Well, I hate to say it, but it's now too late. There ain't no miracle technology to save us from our fate. Don't believe them when they tell you we can keep on driving cars because SpaceX is investigating and terraforming, and terraforming Mars. We're wasting time, we're wasting lives, we're wasting yours and wasting mine. While the fire's burning hotter and the oceans are rising faster, and our country is run by a monkey who doesn't even, who denies that the weather is going on. But we can't do it in paralysis. Man, we've run out of time. We can't fail in our analysis or fix things with a rhyme. We have to fight like hell, put our bodies on the line, trust our vision and our skills, and build a movement big and fine. Come and join us. Come and fight. We've got everything to lose. Your life, your home, your legacy, your children's future, too. But we have the right, and we have the light, and it's up to us to choose. Thank you so much. So we have about 20 minutes. We originally planned about an hour of questions and discussion this evening. Um, does our arrangement with the church allow us to go a little over? Anybody know if we want to? Um, so uh, we'll try to, well, we'll go for the 20 minutes we have and then just see where we're at and how we want to go. Maybe everybody who was on the panel should come up and, and have a seat here. So I just, um, just a footnote to Phil's, um, your, what you're saying about Muskrat Falls and that very little of the power may end up coming down here. But the Gull Island project, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but the only plan that Newfoundland seems to be coming up with to deal with the economic losses at the Muskrat Falls is say, well, we'll build the, the second part, the, the Gull Island, and we'll do that, and we'll make money off that by selling that power to the United States. So that seems to be their plan for getting out of the economic hole that they've dealt with by building this dam is to build an even bigger one and to add, you know, a, another, you know, what I think will probably be another disaster. There are people talking about that, but I have trouble taking it seriously. Um, that they're going to build a while? Well, or? certainly the Nalcor could. I mean, it's, it's leveraged, uh, you know, far beyond, uh, far beyond reason. And the idea that the money can be found to do this I don't take it very seriously. But on the other hand, there's all kinds, all kinds of big things you, you hear whispering about negotiations with Hydro Quebec. The Hydro Quebec will somehow come in, come in and save the day. And whether they're coming in and saving the day involves building Bell Island or not, 
you know, it's in, we're in the land of total speculation. And I just want to say too about the, the Romanian Catholic Church is not a catastrophe, it's a catastrophe to the river. It's a complete yeah. catastrophe. I've seen the Romanian River, I've been there. It was the most beautiful, pristine, one of the longest. It was a wild salmon river. It had the most spectacular waterfall, totally untouched forest, wetlands. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. And it's totally ruined. I was speaking. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to make that point. So about the Romanian, is it up and running? You said it's looking Really finished the day. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Romaine 1 and Romaine 2 are in service. I heard um, that the third and fourth, the fourth one is totally running now? No, I don't think so. I think they're both, but I, as I recall, the, the commission dates were supposed to be in 2019 and 20, so. Oh, uh, okay, because I heard they finished the construction of the fourth now. That was the really big one. Yeah. And the fourth one was the largest reservoir. Yeah. Because the others are built on waterfalls, but that one is built on waterfalls, so they have to flood. Somebody else, yes. Is Hydro Open Beck building any other, um, destroying any other rivers in Quebec right now, other than the Romain? Um, not to my not Right now, no. There is talk about building another power station on the St. Margaret. And um, you, hear, you hear contradictory things. I mean, for years, Hydro Quebec's sort of been saying, you know, I think we're done after this. <laughs> but then the politicians always want to build dams, you know. So then the, the, the government puts out an energy policy that says that Hydro-Quebec will decide about its next dam. So Hydro-Quebec has to do what the government says to do. Uh, and then I came across a study that was produced by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is an organization run by Jeffrey Sachs, who was under UN auspices. Uh, a study done together with Hydro-Quebec about uh, looking at options of dramatically reducing northeast greenhouse gas emissions by dramatically increasing imports from Quebec. And it actually looks at a scenario of increasing imports by 30 terawatt hours a year, which is essentially doubling what it is today. And adding 9,000 megawatts of transmission, and it crunches a bunch of numbers and says, uh, oh yeah, this would be a great idea. So I talked to somebody at Hyper Quebec about it, and because there's a lot of strange things about it. And he said, oh, it's, you know, it's not a planning study. It's not even a feasibility study. It's really sort of a marketing study. It's the idea to let the Americans know that we could do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that point, I would want to add that Jeffrey Sachs is an advisor to the Sanders Foundation. And uh, we tried to contact him about a month or two ago to get him involved. And then I did send him a copy of the press release for the event. Be able to have a discussion with us regarding his positions. I talked with him at the launch of uh, SDCN, SDSN Canada, and, uh, and he was interested. In, you know, uh, he asked me to send him some information, which I did. And I'm not sure who was first. <laughs> yeah, um, this is sort of a Vermont power planning kind of question. If just suppose uh, consumption was reduced, let's say the capacity needs were reduced by, say, 50 megawatts. Um, which would you do first? Would you say no thank you to maybe a 20-year continuation of the Hydro-Quebec contract or shutting down the McNeil plant? Who is that question addressed to, I wonder? Just to anybody? Anybody? I imagine there would be some debate about that. Waiting for Rachel. Well, I would, I would um, actually, in spite of the fact that the biomass facility is, you know, my flavor of energy opposition, I would say that a 20-year contract with Hydro-Quebec would have a lot bigger implication than shutting down a very, what's actually a very tiny biomass facility. So that would be what I would say, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Burlington speaks as if the McNeil plant is its main source of, or one of its main sources of electricity. But we saw from Steve Sharp that it's actually tiny. I was shocked to see just how tiny a component of the overall Burlington energy mix is represented by that plant, which is one of, if not the 
leading sources of air of in-state air pollution. Yeah. I think part of the story with that is that they don't take all the electricity from me. Right. Right. So that's why they have a smaller slice. And, and thing. McNeil burns gas too. Sorry, right. I didn't mean to attach it to any particular utility. I was just saying wood versus exist, existing wood power plant versus existing hydro, mega hydro, which, you know, which thing do you just take away first? A 20-year contract with Hydro would be a very significant step. <laughs> so John and then Meg. Yeah, I'm going to be the heretic here in this church. Give some pushback. Um, I think there's an aspect we have to look at this is pick your poison. And everybody is um, focusing on Hydro and saying it's all terrible. But every other option I know of is worse. I'll give it a couple of examples. But in Newfoundland, before they started with the Muscat Falls, the debate was, do we go do the hydroelectric or do we do offshore oil and gas drilling? In 1970, when they started doing the James Bay, you know, which is 30,000 square miles of flooding, um, the Anglo government, federal government, was pushing for nukes. And eventually, you know, Barasa and his, his crew said, no, we're going to go hydro. So there are always worse options. Okay. I think that's one point. The other thing I want to ask about, especially the fellow from Quebec, about Hydro-Quebec, my understanding is that they subsidize their domestic electricity rates, so it's very, very cheap to... Uh, no, it's not subsidized. It is cheap because their power is cheap. I mean, actually, rates have gone up very substantially since this, since this restructuring thing. Well, okay. But, yeah. but uh, I think it's a mistake to think of it as a subsidy. Hydro-Quebec is a revenue producer. Yeah, and, okay. Produces a great deal of revenue. Where, where it's a public deal. Yep. Yeah. And so the money goes back to the government and to the taxpayers one way or the other. They, they, they charge very low rates. And there's a very high, uh, the maximum utilization of hydro per back is 39,000 megawatts. And that occurs in the middle of the winter. You know? So there's a lot of inefficient heating and so on and so forth. If they would charge a higher rate, domestic rate, the people get it back anyway. And then they could have, you know, basically they could support their other programs. Quebec has a high level, supposedly high level of debt that constantly gets attacked by the New York Liberals. Sorry, there's a high level of provincial debt. And so they're constantly being, oh, we've got to cut back on welfare, blah, 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 blah. So is that, I mean, how do Quebec rates are really done on a cost of service basis? The, you know, the system that, that was developed by Americans in the first part of the century and that is still used in, in most of the country. Okay. Uh, and, um, I mean, rates are, I mean, are debated every year, uh, the details of it, but the basic approach is that if the utility charges what it will, pays its costs and makes a regulated, uh, a reasonable return on its, on its equity. Uh, the, the interesting part is, is to what extent HQ distribution has access to HQ production's power. And the 2000 law stipulates that there's a, a block of 165 terawatt hours a year that HQD can purchase at a regulated or, or a legislated rate of three cents a kilowatt. How do, HQP still makes money selling to HQD at three cents because its cost of production is under two cents. Yeah. Um, but uh, Maybe we can talk about this another time. It's a long story. It's a long debate. But the, the, idea, the idea of raising rates just for the sake of raising rates um, and make a lot of money, get back in taxes, is problematic because there's a lot of winners and losers. A lot of the public does not pay taxes. We have a very progressive tax system in that. Forget if it's 30 or 40 percent of the public doesn't pay income taxes. So you're, you're taking money out of uh, consumers and people who pay most of the taxes are the wealthiest people. Well, uh, the way I'm thinking about this, for example, we want to tax carbon to shift it away from, you know, and by, by you know, there is carbon emissions, we, we'll grant that from hydro, but, um, you know, basically by, by charging low rates, you're, you're basically encouraging excess consumption of the resource, domestically. You know. so, and we can we correct the tax business about, you know, getting rebates to low income people, that's not the issue.
Let's hear from some other people and we can come back to this. Uh, Meg, put her hand up first and then the man in the back. I'm what is the most effective way you think to turn back the tissue? Is it Reggie, the RPS, the individual state definitions of eyebrow? I could suggest something about that in terms of Vermont and in terms of uh, the uh, the. Uh, closest win uh, for us, I think, would be uh, to revisit the renewable energy standard that we have, uh, which now is three-tiered. First tier is everything. It's mostly Hydro-Quebec. Uh, and that's, we're 55% now and it grows to 90. Uh, 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 tier two is the sort of the, to me, the right spot. Uh, that right now is very low. That's the distributed new renewable generation. Very low. It grows at 1% a year for a while. Um, Massachusetts just, I think their Senate just passed a bill that would uh, start higher and increase by 3% a year, three times as fast. So I think that, um, you know, it's doable and, and it's shown to be doable because these other legislative bodies are saying, yes, we can do that. Um, but we don't because we have these other things we can say, you know, we don't need to because we get hydro go back. But, but I think that's the biggest thing that I would say the, the first uh, thing we should go after in Vermont is, is increasing that renewable energy standard, the tier two renewable energy standard. And more regionally, like Massachusetts? Sorry? Do you think with Massachusetts that would be the same answer? Uh, well, that's what they're going for. That, you know, the example I gave was Massachusetts, and I think Rhode Island has a similar one that they've introduced, and so... Uh, well, Massachusetts, I, the RPS does not include large hydro. Right, right. So, so again, it's, it's similar to our Tier 2. They're, they're 3% a year, it's like our Tier 2, that's 1% a year. But at the same time, they went and adopted the legislation that, I don't know the details of it, but that essentially obliged them to purchase a large block of imported hydropower. Sure. So, Yes. So it went around the yes. yes. But I would think that the most efficacious thing if, that we could do is somehow require greater efficiency. I mean, that's well, where that's the number one thing we should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very unsexy, but it's the most important thing because if we're reducing the energy consumption, then we are not using power. So. Right. Okay. I mean, Absolutely. here in Vermont, we've been debating increasing funding for home weatherization for years and we get lip service and yet we have a hard time even maintaining a, a steady level of, of state support for home weatherization. We have the second oldest housing stock in the country. We're first. I think you're first. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you were first and then you're next. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to the thought about um, Hydro-Quebec in contrast to other sources of energy, and to point to the fact that um, you know the Aborigines in that area have suffered tremendously, and you know as part of the flooding, a lot of their livelihoods were based on trapping and territories, and most of those are hugely impacted. They're not even territory anymore; they're just flat lake water. Um, I think that's a really important issue, and I think the film sort of pointed to that. And you know, there 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 are no easy solutions, but I think to, to say that um, you know that type of social devastation for Aborigines uh, is is less of a problem than you know some offshore drilling, which obviously is a huge problem. I think that's I'm not really looking at. I don't know exactly where I'd be, um, where to start with the problem, but uh, this um, woman here was talking about fashion. And then we look at what is, what comes off of that as far as carbon. Fashion comes from a certain mindset. That mindset is promoted 
by society, by the, the way that we're taught and educated by the academics. We're into math and science with total disregard to other, um, other ways of thinking or pulling in what it means to be human. So why don't we go to the root of the problem that creates the need to consume, which has to do with dissatisfaction in one's way of being and the way that one is in the world. So if we got to that, there could be a great reduction in material need and really not suffer because if anybody's been anywhere like some of these people with indigenous people or if you travel they never went to some of the poorest places in the world there's a lot of joy there what happened here i you know i, I won't go on but um in laos they just lost the big dam I don't know if you know about that, okay? I was in China in the 80s and I went through the Three Gorges before they built that dam. They're proposing, I think, either 40 new dams or a total of 40 dams on the Mekong River. If you want to talk about rotten water mm -hmm. and rotten food, you guys are just starting up north. <laughs> It has to do with the way the system, not the system, the way that we are not thinking as an alternative way of being. Let's, with academic, let's start with some of this stuff. And, and, but you have to find joy, you have to find happiness for the people. You can't put them in debt, you can't put the kids in debt, and you can't start out that way. If you start out that way, they are, they cannot break free. You got the t-shirt on. So, um, a simple way of being, and there's other philosophies that come from other lands that can very well be listened to, and joy can be found in the population, and then transform this political system from a way of not use. In Kenya, they're starting to complain about electricity use there, not from the people, but the people who've already put in the dams. We use, I think, 13,000 kilowatts a year as a human being in the United States, and what they, in Kenya, they're only using 300, like 350, so they're really worried about getting payback. I hope Africa can pay attention to what is happening here. And in Niger, we lost four, guys in the Green Beret. And there's a lot going on that we don't pay attention to. Niger is one of the poorest countries in Africa. They got a natural resource and many others. It's um, uranium. The uranium, I would like the academics to look into where that uranium goes start with France. If they're getting their electricity for their nuclear power plants from Niger for all of these years, and, and, and believe me, I don't have any facts. I just hear a lot and I've been around a little bit. Um, let's, let's see how much France has put back into Niger. Let's see how much France put into Vietnam before they were thrown out. They're not very, we're not sharing very much and allowing indigenous people to stay in their joy. We don't just help them to get a little bit happier with clean water, a little bit of medicine. We have to go in and have them be just like us. Thank you, that's my two cents. I think we have a partial response from Joan. Joan Sachs is also oh, here from the Sierra Club in Maine. I wanted to ask one thing about what's the next steps in the ICT and do you respond to them or just are you just one of the leaders? Um, 
Yeah, well, so they were, uh, they were, <coughs> in Paris, they were <coughs> mandated to do a report on, you know, how to achieve 1.5 degrees. And so that report is in the second, the second draft has already been uh, through. Uh, and I can't remember when it's supposed to be released. I think it's in October coming up. I think so. I think that's right. Um, you know, a lot of people commented on it, and there was actually a very large group of people who made comments about some of the things that I brought up, and there were many other concerns, but how they got incorporated into the ultimate report, and especially in the executive summary, I don't know yet. Um, and then this land mitigation report is still, it, it was in a very embryonic phase when it came out for its first round of review, I would say. Um, where it will end up, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> when it starts, when you start there, it's like a long path to sort of um, envision how, how drastically it would need to change to really reflect. I mean, there's a big international uh, coalition of groups that are really intimately involved with all of this who are actually producing their own version of what land mitigation should look like and what we would support, because just trying to comment, you know, and little forms with little comments through, you know, all that is just like, yeah, you can't make any really profound change, uh, so it makes more sense to try to express uh, the, the real vision that people have, and that's what I think people are working on right now. I so it's a... One more comment. I wish you'd send your poem to the Times as an epilogue to the epilogue, but the piece that they bring the past. Losing her. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to have a copy of it anyway. <laughs> so it's a couple of minutes after 7. Should we go another 15, 20 minutes? Does it seem about right? Yes. Yeah, I just had another uh, comment. This, this is like a biomass issue. Is it, I'm sorry, is it Helm? Rachel? Rachel. Rachel. Uh -huh. um, yeah, have, have you looked at any of the, there's been a lot on carbon accounting done UVM. There's a guy, Tony D'Amato, who's uh, he's sort of the, runs the forestry school for the most part. He's done a lot of carbon accounting work um, on biomass. And everything I've seen is, is very different from what you described. Um, you know, he comes up with a, it's a mixed scenario and it depends a lot on how the forestry is done with, with that. But I just urge you to take a look at some of that because um, well, it really has a different slant altogether, and, and especially, for example, you know, the idea um, that when we use land for biomass, that that land is really not being used to grow trees afterwards, um, and therefore the carbon sequestration of tree growth is not an issue. And I just would be very curious to know any Thing more than an acre or two in all of New England that's been used for biomass that is not being returned to uh, forestry. I mean, if you have some, I'd love to know about them. That is not being returned to forestry? Right. Well, I, I haven't done the, gone out there and looked at every acre that's been harvested, and there's different levels of harvesting, so I would have no answer to that. But well, you I just want to. You were saying that, that that's one of the problems is the land is often not used or returned to forestry. Right, and, and we can't just go out there and assess every acre. And, well, you know, actually, there are inventories that do speak to that, and that's why I'm asking the question because the inventories are, are, don't show that at all. Well, the inventories also, I mean, a very fundamental problem with the inventories is that they don't, uh, they don't differentiate between, say, tree plantations, replanted forest, uh, and what happens when you cut, say, a, a, an older or even an old growth forest. They basically equate tree cover as tree cover. So you have, you know, uh, I just came back from the Pacific Northwest where, you know, there's all this ancient old growth dug fir, beautiful cedar forest that has been clear cut and replaced with monocultures. Uh, all of that in most of the accounting is done, you know, it's tree, it's forest, it's forest, it's plantation, it's a forest, if it's an old growth forest, it's a forest, it's forest, it's forest. 
It's planted forest, maybe, or you know, sometimes there's some differentiation. But, but I just want to go back to the first comment that you made. What I want to be clear about is that there is a huge lot of people working in academics who have been challenging exactly that carbon neutral myth very repeatedly and very thoroughly with careful measurements and, and long research. But it hasn't translated into the policy realm. The policies are still continuing to support the idea that it's carbon neutral to burn trees for electricity, for the most part. There's you know, a little bit more nuance in the game right now, like Europe just revised their renewable energy directive, and there's some more nuance in there. And there's the idea that we have to have, it, uh, you know, have some sustainability standards in place and whether that works or not. So I don't want to say that there's not, there's a, a lot of people out there and a lot of people in academics who have been arguing this point for a very, very long time. But the policies have not changed to reflect that. Well, um, I, I think there's more information out there. Um, I'm on the National Policy Committee for uh, Society of American Foresters, and we look at the work that Tony does. We look at the work that comes out of university, and we have position statements that you know they really talk directly to that issue, and they reflect the, the most recent science. So uh, there may be other policy issues in places, but as far as the professional group of foresters are, are concerned, it's a direct translation. We work completely with people like Tony's model, scientists at different universities. And how do you translate that into policy in terms of um, whether a state renewable energy standard, for example, has a renewable energy goal and whether biomass burning is subsidized under that or supported under that or not? I'm sorry. I didn't I, I'm wondering how you, as the Society of American Foresters, translate the, the, the knowledge that you have about this into the policy. Sure, record. because we're directly related to the major players in forestry, whether it's the U.S. Forest Service, whether it's corporations, whether it's small landowners, and there's a discussion, and that's why we have these position statements, so that people can talk to a group that does forestry as their livelihood and as their focus. So, and that's why we have these things. So that, I mean, I don't know enough about it to say, you know, of a specific state, a specific policy, and, and who, how that was developed, but that's all definitely in play. Yeah. There's a hand in the front here. She, she I, just, she I, just wanted, here. I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, I've been reading that large old growth forests are sequester carbon at a much greater rate than young trees. And, and, and a diverse forest does. So how do you respond to that in your policy if you're, you know, you're talking about monocultures, as, you know, which is what is replaced most of the time in forestry? How do you, how do you answer that? Well, it, it does depend a lot on where you are. So in New England, monocultures typically do not replace uh, lands that are harvested. Um, there is a lot more of it in the Northwest. Some of that's also been going on for quite a while. Um, and uh, you know, personally and professionally, I want to preserve every acre of old growth. There's not a lot. Um, you know, forestry is like a lot of disciplines. There's there are two extremes. Some people would be perfectly fine with harvesting every acre of everything. Other people who are foresters are looking at it purely from an ecological standpoint and really want to harvest as little as possible. Um, uh, speaking for, for this society, we try to strike the middle of it. Um, but there is no overriding goal of, of uh, destroying what little old growth there is whatsoever. It's just not something I do. Well, just from, from my perspective, though, all across from New, from New York through Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, we have a very large contiguous forest that is essentially the lungs of New England. Since we're also at the tailpipe of the rest of the country, we should be preserving that forest in every way we possibly can. That's my perspective. Henry, and then back to Meg. <clears throat> I mean, I don't think that there really is a middle ground between uh, industry. There's no middle ground at all, right? The extreme position that we find ourselves in is we're in hot water, and we probably can't get out but we have to put all of our creative resources, all of our industrial resources, you know, and that's a very, there's a lot of caveats to how to use your industrial resources wisely um, into all of our energies into trying to get the hell out of this mess just because 
things are greener in Vermont right now doesn't mean things look really good or even tenable in the medium term here. So I think you know so much of this analysis, to me, it just I just sit around and kind of think about the Titanic and the diving teams come back up out of the engine room and they're like, yeah, this is what happened. It was the engines. No, it was the, they come and they examine the hole. Oh, the hole is this big. It's that big. This is the rate we're going down at, right? We're going down, right? What anecdotally, what has created the kinds of cultural shifts that are needed, right? Because we need a cultural shift. There's not, you know, here we are going to analyze and reassess and convene and curate these conversations about what the real problems are, but, or what the rhetorical solutions might be, but how are we going to force the goddamn application of those solutions? And we need to create a platform for so doing. It's not about a platform is only going to be good, a powerful flat platform is only going to be good for the application of one solution, right? It's going to be good for trying some shit, probably screwing it up and trying some more shit as soon as possible, right? In the very near term, in 1.5 degrees Celsius. I don't know what the odds they're giving that anymore, but they're not really giving it any goddamn odds. What they're, what, the odds that we're getting is that once we get to well above two degrees Celsius, what do the feedback loops start to do? You know, and all of the shit that we're not even supposed to really talk about in public and all of that crap. So at the end of the day, I don't think it's a question of whether or not you can industrially harvest timber, that's absurd. The way that that's being done by forestry, it keeps on being. Trying to protect jobs and resources is really important, that's real. But it keeps on being short-term jobs against society and against brown and black bodies around the world who are going down in Syria and going down uh, you know, underwater in the Marshall Islands, of course. But you know. So I guess my question to anybody on the panel is, you know, what are the opportunities to try to build some people power and, you know, how, what are the, what's the messaging, what's the rollout look like to actually do something that turns our back a little bit temporarily on all the data and tries to create some kind of a platform to get some crap done? Let me try and say a couple of things about that. The first is that Pushing forward more real renewables is critically important for a number of reasons. One are all the things that Steve said, but another is the more you rely on renewables, and anyone who has solar panels or an electric car knows this, the more you think about what you're using. That, that's really important. Those two things go very much together. Another point, I have enormous admiration for people who engage in the process that produces all of this crap. That is, you have the PUC here in Vermont. You have all of these hearings and procedures and so on in Quebec. You have to have people who stand up for the rights of people who are facing the consequences of disasters like that. What's more, what we come to understand from dealing with all of that is the value of what was destroyed. And one of the huge problems we have is all of this playing around with language that goes on, what counts as renewable, what doesn't count as renewable, and all of the economic manipulation that goes on in order to solve a problem is all at the level of fantasy. What really is going on when people deal in these situations on those terms is that they are destroying the world to save the world. And that makes no sense whatsoever. And they're huge, huge things that are being done. I mean, Hydro-Quebec is a tremendous sort of thing, transporting all of that power from far away into urban centers. It's what I was saying before. As you push renewables, you actually get back to the Edison situation of generating at a small scale for local people who you know and so on, and that really is what matters. And it seems so frail in relation to these gigantic problems, but it's really all there is. If we can convince the state of Vermont to have ecologists and environmentalists who know something about the world figuring in the determination about whether we should build certain projects or not, we would be at a tremendous advantage relative to where we are. Are they going to do it? No. And that gets to Rachel's point 
and that is we can keep pushing all these things and when they say no, 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 we will get angrier and angrier and angrier and we will get more and more people out to throw them out. And that's, that's what's going to resolve this problem and nothing else. But you have to keep pushing from within the circumstances that, that you're given to deal with, with these things. Little will produce big results, I think. I love this guy. <laughs> Let's maybe give others on the panel a chance to respond to the question. How do, how do we move forward from here in a way that's proportional to the scale? And of again, life? you've got to like, it's not what, it's how is kind of the question, right? <clears throat> Yeah, I think there's the what is part of the how, actually. I think that you have to have a vision. And, uh, you know, what's the vision? Uh, my, uh, when I talk to some of the people that, that do this stuff, like in, in Montpelier, VNRC, and CLF, and those folks, uh, they've been working hard on, on nuts and bolts. And that's what they have access to. It's what they carve out as a potential success in the short term, and, and it's what they, they need organizationally. And, but, but they also need to define a vision. And I don't think you, it's one of those things you're not going to get right immediately, but I think they really need, we need a vision of where we're going. I, I don't know if you translate culture directly through a vision. I, do, I think you do that by accident. I don't know how that works. But, but I think we need, we need a vision of where we're going with, a, with an energy economy, a transformation of our society. And so I, I guess I believe that people don't really buy into it if you're just dealing with the nuts and bolts. And that, by the way, this is an enormous earth-shattering problem. Let's nuts and bolts it out of the way. You can't do that. People don't believe it. So you need something bigger that people can believe in. And that's about um, you know, efficiency and renewables and that sort of thing. But then the other side of it, that we haven't really started to address yet, which I think we need to have this conversation, is um, the earth is changing. And, and things are not going to be the same. And we see that in California. We see it in you know, many, many places around the earth far ahead of us. We're sort of on the tail end of the impacts here. And, and yet, we're going to have the impacts too. And, and how, how much worse are the droughts going to get in the summertime before we have to start thinking about water policy in a way that we have big reservoirs that we tap also. And what does that mean? So, and what's the cost of that? So that, that whole area, and we talked about mitigation, but this whole area of adaptation, what's the next phase of life for us? We need a vision for that too. And, and I felt for a long time, I mean, people say if you think too much about adaptation, you're just giving them excuses to go and, and make things worse. But my view is that's the real cost of climate change, is when we wake up and have to deal with this new world. You know, how are we going to move New York City back? How are we going to move Boston back from the coast? And, and who's going to, you know, obviously it's the people who have the resources who are going to be able to handle that more easily. What about all these other people that don't, that can't do it? So to me, there, there's just a host of issues that come up in this realm of adaptation. Vermont's insulated to some degree, but we've, we've got, I mean, you know, I think the water summer issue is really a, a big one for us down the road. Where are, where are our kids going to get their food? Um, and and are they going to get it from where we get it now? I doubt it. I mean, those places are all experiencing droughts, right? The, a lot of our nation's food comes from the, the, uh, the drought-ridden Midwest, the Central Valley of California, all suffering right now. And the snowpack that, that provides water for the Central Valley, that's disappearing. So. Um, I think, we, I think the answer has already been started to be addressed with local food in Vermont to some degree, you know, but we have to expand that. We have to figure out how to use the soil in a way that captures carbon and doesn't pollute Lake Champlain and, and, uh, and, and can provide for our children. We and could, we have to not turn it into shopping bags. to um, the food people out west. Am I right? They're going to get billions right now. They've been getting it for years. Oh, the subsidies. The soil. Sure. Yeah. Now, yes. what, what happened to the wetlands out there in the past? Why? Soy they could sell to China. But anyway. I'd like to get the response from you. Yeah, so so um, I, I agree with a lot of what, I mean, everything that Steve said. But I, I think here in Vermont, so we are, a, a, Maine is a state that has 1.3 million people. 
you have 654,000, I think, it's something like that, yeah. um, here in Vermont. So yeah. we're both states that have smaller populations than the cities. For me, I live on an island. I'm already seeing subsidence, subsiding all the, you know, the bluffs on my island. My son is a lobsterman, you know, and, and a boat builder, and I am a farmer. I've had the fourth, fourth year in a row of drought. I have sheep. I have been putting cisterns in. I am trying to figure out how to plant windbreaks because the wind situation we're having right now is pretty significant. And, um, you know, uh, I was just on the way up here talking about somebody who's using biomass to heat greenhouses for an organic, a big organic farm on the island. Um, you know, that's not a sustainable solution. Um, we have to figure out, and I think we as small communities, whether it's my island, my small state, or your even smaller state, can be examples to the rest of the country and how, if we really see our states as, or our locations as islands, as small communities where you can really address these things, but it takes everybody to have the solution. I mean, you really have to get into the schools, you have to work with the Children's Trust to get the kids to sue. I forget who mentioned, you mentioned that. You know, those things are incredibly important. And kids speaking about this stuff. I just was at a, you know, not recently, but recently at a, uh, a hearing at the Department of Environmental Protection in Maine where kids were speaking. They listened. The rest of us just, you know, helped them get to the point of being able to talk. And they are very articulate about what's going on in their world, you know. So I think that's, we need to help those kids get there and to speak about it and make a change. The so. kids in Vermont this spring semester had three events of over 2,000 youth that they organized at the State House. That's great. It was amazing. Yeah. Phil, last thoughts? I don't really have an answer for you. <laughs> uh, but I do think that um, knowledge is important. And that, I mean, you know, my, my work is on electricity systems. Electricity systems are really complicated. And if you don't get the complexity that you don't understand what the people are saying to you, and um, you know, to say we want a 100% renewable, perfectly clean and green electricity system uh, is a great objective, but then you have to start thinking, how, what does that actually mean in terms of an electricity system that, that functions? And um, th there aren't, the answers aren't really easy. There are difficult trade-offs and there are cost trade-offs, you know, like everybody, Nobody wants their rates to double either. We're going to have um, to spend some money. Yeah, but I mean, it, I think it's really important for um, the environmental movement and for, for concerned citizens to be part of the discussion. But it, I often see there's this enormous divide because the people who are actually deciding what's going to happen are talking on a completely different, you know, they're, they're using a different language and dealing with problems that aren't obvious to the general public. And so, They're using you know, code. It's code, but it's also that, you know, these, these changes in the 1990s, I mean, electricity by its nature is complicated, but the systems that now manage it are insanely complicated. These hourly markets and the hourly capacity markets, and you know, every state has its own, and these very, very complicated structures, uh, which is part of the problem, too. Rachel, last thoughts? Um, let's see. Um, <coughs> I guess people people are always um, you know complaining to me about you know well you don't like biomass and you're complaining about hydro and you don't like the Vermont gas pipeline and what do you want you know should we just go back to the Stone Age and you know <laughs> what is it you know and I I, uh, I think you know I, I I embarrassingly admit that you know well the Stone Age might not be that bad really like people live for millions of years without all this stuff you know and um, there's you know if we were to actually stop and think and set priorities about what we absolutely need in order to have some joy uh, it wouldn't really be that much and we could survive like it's not like if the power goes out oh my god life is going to end you know uh, and we need to like start to embrace that idea that we can and that we need to set priorities and that we need to have basically like emerging emergency planning in place for when we turn into Puerto Rico here you know because that's coming our way um, so that's that's one of my um, 
thoughts. The other thing, I just want to add a voice for biodiversity because, you know, we get into these conversations about all this stuff and it's about how it's going to impact people, how it's going to impact people, how it's going to impact people. And it's like we're completely removed from the rest of the web of life. And the rest of the web of life is like completely collapsing around us. So, uh, you know, what we do to support the ecosystems that are remaining and restore them uh, is really re restoring the web. It is our best line of defense in every respect. So allowing, for example, forests to grow back to their, you know, uh, former glory is not just about carbon sequestration or how much energy we can get out. It's about supporting the web of life on Earth that provides our oxygen and everything else. And I feel like that just too often gets out of the equation and we talk a lot about, I mean, human rights are a very important thing and not a lot will happen without human rights being respected. But we need to also start uh, incorporating the rights of nature into our thinking at every level. So that's what I would also add. I also want to add a couple of thoughts. Uh, I agree that we need culture change. We also need political and economic change. And the way cultures, politics, and economics change, I know you agree with this, is through social movements. And here in Vermont, we've been slowly building the beginnings of a movement that can deal with these questions. I think the leading edge demand that emerged out of the fight against the pipeline in Addison County was no new fossil fuel infrastructure. We now have uh, more than 35 towns in Vermont on record supporting that demand. And over the next several months, we'll be figuring out how to move forward with that. Uh, the other point I want to make is that um, we have a paradox of scale in this system. Uh, under the current economic and political arrangements, only the largest and most disruptive implementations of renewable technology are considered economically viable. And that's not okay. And we have a system that at the same time that it's nickel and diming us around affordability of renewable energy thrives on waste, thrives on militarism and continual expansion, and we really need to get the to the core of questioning the system. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to say quickly, um, I'm not saying that knowledge is not power. I just think that in the way the movement was reframed by McKibben and Hansen, that it was only about knowledge and that we were gonna just use raw information to sway the tide in the policy arena was drastically and just the most, it was like terrorism. I mean, what, what, what's the term? It was such a bad, bad, bad move. It was so lacking in strategy and a lot of lives were lost as we lost that ground. There's gotta be parity between building people power and our, our say, analysis and, and movement. So I want to thank everybody for coming, thank the panel for... <laughs> and this will continue into this evening. We're going up to uh, the campground just below Stowe uh, for a potluck. We still have some snacks in the back room here. Uh, tomorrow at 2.30, we're gathering on the road outside the, the Snow Mountain Resort at the top of Smuggler's Notch uh, to respond to the governor's conference and the fact that they're not dealing with these questions, uh, with many of these questions. And then we'll have our own press conference at 5 in response to the governor's press conference at 4 o'clock. So thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.